condition uh, following spinal cord injuries and what was asked to talk about cutting edge strategies. Uh, first, and maybe this doesn't sound super exciting in terms of cutting edge and high technology, but uh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that prevention is still one of the things that we need to do in terms of preventing spinal cord injuries. But there could be some technological things to do uh, related to this, even simple things like seat belts, uh, airbags, and even automatic uh, 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 use of those, and other engineering improvements in vehicles, especially since motor vehicle accidents are such a high rate of spinal cord injuries. Uh, using technology for education, especially uh, young uh, people that uh, uh, need to be educated about the risks that they're taking, and even motion technology to prevent uh, distracted driving and deactivation of some of the devices is an ongoing uh, technology, technological advancements for prevention. Also, uh, technology to prevent some of the complications. This is a report from uh, Savick et al. in spinal cord injury this year in a 70-year study, study in Great Britain uh, looking at the different complications. And so understanding uh, and, and using science to understand the complication rates uh, related to spinal cord injury and then prevention. And one of, the, one of the main things that we deal with in the complications is skin issues, and that can lead to sepsis and, and then uh, a significant morbidity and mortality related to pressure ulcers. Uh, there is technology looking at uh, use of electric stimulation, uh, and this was a study by Lala et al. in the International Wo uh, Wound Journal in 2017, uh, looking at how wound size can decrease with use of electric stimulation. There are still many, many options with regards to uh, barriers and skin uh, devices and, and new uh, companies and many new products. Uh, but ultimately, prevention of pressure ulcers is the best treatment. Uh, frequent turns, skin care, mattress selection, training and education, and, the, and ultimately the use of technology to make that much more widespread no matter where the patient is to uh, ensure that the prevention is taken. I'll touch a little bit on stem cells as well. It seems to be the hot topic uh, between uh, yesterday uh, as, as well as today. And again, as, uh, as Eric mentioned, neural stem cells have been around for a long time. Uh, Johansson was using them in, in 1999. Uh, but again, around that time, in, 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 uh, Namiki and Tater did talk about the limitations of stem cells in the late 90s uh, because of limited neurogenesis after spinal cord injury and the use of those stem cells. And most of the neural stem cells that are used, unfortunately, convert to astrocytes. And so that uh, limits their application uh, within the spinal cord injury population. And the postulation is that most of that is due to the microenvironment at that injured site, where all the inflammatory mediators are, the interleukins and terminal necrosis factor alpha, and those really limit the applicability of the use of stem cells. But currently, there are at least uh, 13 different studies focused on neural stem cell transplantation. Uh, within the spinal cord for spinal cord injury. Uh, and the key component may be that the histone deacetylase inhibitors and combining those with the neural stem cells may lead to greater recovery. Um, so I don't have as fancy a slide as Dr. Fallon said yesterday with his uh, uh, great graphics, but this is a, a, uh, a, a just a demonstration of the intact spinal cord and the inner neurons and what happens in an injured spinal cord in the middle a picture uh, at that center of the spinal cord injury where primarily uh, the surviving uh, host neurons are trying to get around uh, the scar tissue and the astrocytes that develop. And so even with transplanted neurons, there's very little activation uh, and getting around the, all the astrocytes in the epicenter of the spinal cord injury. What they're looking at, and again, uh, when uh, neural stem cells are transplanted alone, there's a significant uh, increase in the number of astrocytes and uh, oligodendrocytes that are developed uh, as opposed to the number of neurons. So the HINT method, the, 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 the uh, uh, acetylase and, and uh, uh, transplant with the neural stem cells and using an inhibitor, and valproic acid uh, is one of those inhibitors, that uh, is felt to uh, give potential for increasing the overall volume of neurons uh, rather than having the astrocytes developed. And so this is new research that's going on. Again, the reprogramming factor uh, in, in, with the stem cells, injecting into the spinal cord injury and providing a con better connection and less astrocyte development because it helps suppress those astrocytes 
and allow the, ne the reprogrammed neurons to, to improve connections. Ongoing animal research as well. I think that's enough on spinal cord uh, stem cells for me as a rehab technique. We're going to look at some of the other uh, specific uh, equipment uh, and cutting edge uh, rehab techniques for equipment. And uh, one, uh, a couple things that have been used more often uh, lately are treadmill training. And whether it's a, a body weight supported system uh, that you see on the right hand side. And again, the benefit of these is it takes less, uh, less physical uh, uh, strength from the therapist standpoint. They can actually use the support system and treadmill training there. And even higher tech anti-gravity systems uh, that you see uh, that can provide full body support and then grade a decrease with the treadmill. And especially uh, helpful for uh, incomplete injuries. And these are devices that are available uh, within the rehabilitation centers and are being used more and more frequently uh, in the centers for, uh, for training. Uh, some of the downside for almost all the cutting edge technology though has to do with cost. So next are robotics. Are robotic uh, devices the answer for assisting spinal cord injury? A lot of uh, ongoing research, uh, including at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, where in addition to myoelectric control, which would be similar to the amputee population, using the intact muscles to help drive distant uh, devices for, for parts of the body that are injured. Working on surface uh, brain electrodes, again, for the same, uh, in the same concept to help derive a device. And again, it, especially at the University of Pittsburgh, working at implanted brain electrodes to help uh, um, uh, use the brain's uh, uh, itself to actually dr uh, drive a distant device. Biggest problem that they've come up with, uh, I, I heard a talk from them, uh, they came to our institution, the biggest problem ends up being uh, over time, again with an implant electrode, if there's scar tissue and needing to replace those uh, implanted electrodes uh, creates difficulty. There are a variety of different upper body exoskeletons, uh, typically used for re uh, rehab and augmenting movement. Uh, several different devices um, uh, that are used throughout. Uh, some of them are uh, inflatable uh, gloves or soft exoskeletons. And the last one on the list is uh, a tremor suppression that may be helpful uh, for patients with increased spasticity and tone as well. But lower body exoskeletons are much more, um, uh, much more widespread in the use in many different companies throughout the world, uh, in Japan and Europe as well as the United States, uh, using these uh, mobile lower body uh, exoskeletons. So I want to touch on a, a couple of those. And in addition to the lower body exoskeletons um, that are not mobile. So these would be used more in the uh, rehab uh, setting uh, like the locomat. Uh, and uh, this one in particular has options for pediatric care. So exoskeletons and the, and the devices that are used, especially for the lower extremity, uh, are typically divided into assistive exoskeletons for ambulation. Uh, so uh, Rexbionics in New Zealand, the uh, WPAL uh, from Japan, and the Rewalk, uh, uh, which is one of the devices that is FDA approved uh, and uh, actually used in, uh, in the United States in the Veterans Affairs Department uh, and is approved for use there. Those are all considered to be assistive exoskeletons for ambulation. Uh, the next uh, set, like the Locomat, uh, HAL, uh, Kinesis, and EXO, another one of the approved uh, through the FDA and the VA uh, devices, those are felt to be rehabilitative in terms of gait improvements, but in reality, even the assistive exoskeletons that j are just used for ambulation have been felt to have rehabilitative uh, and strengthening uh, capabilities as well. And then the other classification difference is the control mechanism of these device, whether there's a joystick control, whether it's, it's human body and controlled through the posture, so as the person stands up, then the device is activated, uh, or if there's other intramuscular surface electrode control uh, with these devices. But there's some limitations. They are heavy. Um, they are definitely not light. Uh, and if you've ever seen anybody walk with one, uh, it is, it's impressive because they have not been able to walk, but it, I can't say that it's a very normal uh, gait. It's definitely much slower, probably on the order of at least uh, 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 twice as slow, uh, almost three times as slow, and costly in U.S. dollars between forty to $70,000 just uh, for 
uh, the devices that are commercially available for use. There's also other limitations in terms of the size. Uh, the size of the patient matters, so if you're too tall, too short, too big, too skinny, uh, all, of those, uh, all of those matter. You have to fit into a relatively narrow window at this time. Uh, the weight of the device just itself is, it can be quite bulky, including the weight and, uh, and, and limitations with the power supply and where the power supply is. Is it integrated into the device itself? Is it worn as a backpack and connected? The power supply and the, and the use of the battery and the type of battery and the battery life uh, are, are clearly limitations uh, to the current commercially available devices. Control of spasticity is a big issue. Uh, if the patient is significant, has significant spasticity, they may be constantly fighting the device uh, and that can create problems, uh, as I spoke about earlier, in the musculoskeletal system, uh, on the joint, extra joint pressure, skin breakdown, and other problems in terms of uh, related to the body really trying to fight the device. The joint mechanics, uh, you need to have a significant range of motion. You can't, again, have uh, any underlying osteoarthritis that may impede some of the, uh, significant osteoarthritis that may impede uh, the, the motion that's necessary for the device to work. And uh, almost all of the devices list a need for having somebody with them, which makes sense. You don't want to be out uh, walking around someplace uh, and have the device fail and uh, you're left without any uh, backup. Uh, so having a companion with you. But that, of course, limits the applicability of these devices because especially in the United States, the patients that we see either want to go to school or go to their job or, or be much more independent. And while the device may, le may provide some, uh, some functional benefit in terms of standing and control of spasticity and even the personal satisfaction of being able to stand, needing to have somebody there so the global application of these devices may be somewhat limited. Maybe much better used for in a home environment unless somebody is uh, single and doesn't have a, a companion uh, with them. So the technology is, is, is the, the, the use of technology and the cutting edge for these, these devices is there um, and it is actually improving as well. Uh, still some, a lot of different bugs to work through in terms of the limitations. So uh, in conclusion, unfortunately, the cutting edge uh, rehab technique still remains prevention. Uh, it, is, it is really necessary to prevent uh, spinal cord injury as best as we can. It's important to optimize the treatment of medical complications. Um, and again, using uh, all of the uh, skills that we have to do that. Technology, again, is advancing. There are improving options, especially for things that are important to, to patients. I do know the first time that I saw somebody who was confined to a wheelchair use the rewalk to stand up, uh, it was, it was life-changing for them. And I, it, people talked about just the being able to stand up uh, in their kitchen, uh, standing up for, their, for a wedding, um, and those type of things were, were, uh, were very important to them. Definitely improving options. We're getting more and more user-friendly. Uh, being able to develop more and more functional applications uh, with the use of the technology, especially the, the, uh, the uh, external devices. And they're getting less and less expensive, although cost remains an issue uh, to date at this time. Thank you. Thanks for all speakers for their nice presentation. And uh, if anybody has a question or comments.